Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. For the video today, I wanted to sit down and talk a bit about adenomyosis because April is Adenomyosis Awareness Month. It is also a year on from when I was diagnosed. So, I mean, I was diagnosed in April last year. I also have a pretty big life update to share that also ties into this. So I thought I'd talk all about that today. Now, I just wanted to explain what the video is about because I know some of you watching this might watch some of my regular videos and just want to know what's going on with me and some people watching this might have found it because they have adenomyosis as well. But either way, now you know what to expect for this video. I also thought at the top of this video I would go in with a definition of the disease so you would fully understand what I'm talking about today in case you haven't heard of it yet or quite understand just yet. So. The definition of adenomyosis that I found online says adenomyosis occurs when the tissue that normally lines the uterus, endometrial tissue, grows into the muscular wall of the uterus, the displaced tissue continues to act normally, thickening, breaking down and bleeding during each menstrual cycle. There's also two ways that adenomyosis can sort of show up or um, grow, I guess. There is either focal where it is in large sections um, or one large section very clear to see in that one spot or diffuse where it is lots of it little bits and all over and that's what I have diffuse adenomyosis. I also saw another point that popped up when I was looking online that I wanted to put to bed because this fact um, it's it's incorrect and it pissed me off it was saying that this is a bit of an older woman's disease what's the actual thing it said um, this is just one section but I have heard people say this before and even doctors have been a bit surprised when I've mentioned I have adeno. They weren't specialists in this disease, but um, there is definitely misinformation out there. What I read was adenomyosis most often occurs in late childbearing years and typically disappears after menopause. So I think that's a little bullshit. I don't know if that was a fact in the past because maybe it just takes so, so, so long to diagnose or, um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, a lot of women's health conditions have issues where we're not believed by doctors or treated, let's say, in the same way as gender neutral diseases or, I guess, conditions that men might face. I feel like a lot of people have said this. If men had endo and adeno or any of these conditions, we would have treatments or cures already. But I'm not going to go off on a rant on that subject. I just thought I wanted to clarify the whole point about it being an older woman's disease because I have had it definitely since I was 19. That was when I was shown to have it on imaging from my first surgery. And at the time, my doctor didn't diagnose me or treat any endo because she didn't see it. She was not a specialist in endo or adeno like my current doctor is. And when he saw pictures from 10 years ago, he could see that I had adenomyosis then. And quite honestly, I believe I've probably had it since around the start of my period um, or the onset of puberty because I've had a lot of the symptoms this whole time. On the subject of symptoms as well, I wanted to go through those just because obviously I've spoken about physically what happens, but the side effects that we notice and the pains that we have when we have adenomyosis can include a lot of things. I looked up some of the most common ones and these are things that I experience. I know there are some other ones as well. There can be so many different things but the main one is heavy or prolonged bleeding which I definitely have experienced. Um, Non-stop full-on period. My longest one was probably four months when I started and I know that sounds crazy so um, let's all take a breath. Uh, I explained a little bit more about that I think in my adenomyosis video last year but yeah it's definitely prolonged and also heavy bleeding so even when I was not bleeding for a long 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 time um, even a week long period or whatever it would be super heavy that's been my experience almost the whole time I've had periods uh, along with severe cramps which yes I've had severe cramps not just during um, my proper periods but just other times as well like my uterus is definitely quite crampy in general chronic pelvic pain as well and that can be in other parts of the abdomen and pelvic region painful sex is definitely one of the things that people experience fatigue from the disease itself and also blood loss which i've definitely experienced 
I've had a blood, um, not a blood infusion, an iron infusion recently, which has helped a little bit. And I've been taking iron supplements for a long time, but I still feel fatigued. So I think it is a little bit to do with the iron and blood loss, but not always. I still feel pretty fatigued most days. Another one is back pain. And this is referred pain from the abdominal pains. I can't really explain it to the full extent that my doctor explained to me, but it is a very common one that I've experienced also probably since I started getting my period around that age. And I always thought it was unrelated, but it is quite common with adenomyosis. So that's what I'm going to blame it on. Um, another thing that a lot of people experience, I saw this, I've heard about this before, but I've never had, is leg pain, which is another referred pain. So that's also another common one. Now, prior to my diagnosis, when I started speaking with my doctor, um, my specialist surgeon last year, I had never heard of adenomyosis. I do have endometriosis as well, and I've definitely heard of that. I had suspected that, like myself, I suspected I had it for about a decade before I was diagnosed with it. And I feel like there's just information out there, not enough by any means on endometriosis, but even less when it comes to adenomyosis. And the same has to be said for funding as well. Now, I don't share my experience or any times I try to educate about endometriosis or adenomyosis for pity or for attention, but instead just to share awareness and share my experience to hopefully help other people with this similar situation. Again, um, I had not heard of adenomyosis before I was diagnosed with it, so I feel like had I heard about it earlier, maybe I would have also had more of a push to get a diagnosis, just like I was trying to do for the endometriosis. Now, I think the last time I really spoke about anything along these lines was last month when I did briefly talk about endometriosis awareness month. I spoke about some endometriosis related favorites, I think, but didn't go too in depth into my situation because um, what I'm going to talk about later on in the video and also just in general today, I think I wasn't too ready to talk about. Plus, a lot of this stuff I'm talking about now is definitely more related to the adenomyosis. Now for the next little bit in this video, I wanted to catch you up to speed on my health, personally, where I'm at these days, since I guess the last big update, which I guess would have been my laparoscopy that I had last year, and since that lap, I've definitely been on quite a roller coaster, which I've spoken about here and there, but never really went too in depth on, I don't think, um, about the fact of my marina basically ruining my life. And I know a lot of people have great experiences with the marina. It can be really helpful for some people and for some people, not so much. Definitely like me in my case, it caused way more pain than I was already in. And I did have a lot of pain to begin with, but it was just exacerbated by the marina. Now to put into perspective the pain that I did experience from the marina, and again, this is just a me thing. I know some people don't experience this, but when I tell you it was ruining my life, I'm being so serious. Um, the pain that I experienced was worse than any other period pain that I've ever had. It was worse than the post-surgery pain. And in fact, after my surgery, I was prescribed Endone. And I think I've had it a few times before after surgeries in the past. If anything, I think this surgery I healed up from quite well from the surgery itself better than my first lap, I kind of knew more of what to expect. But Endone kind of became my stock standard pain relief for cramps due to my period or just from the marina cramps itself. And that was quite concerning. I came to a point where, you know, Panadol definitely wouldn't do anything. I think I was taking Naproxen or some sort of anti-inflammatory. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Naproxen. Um, and that didn't really help, but I gave it a chance. It was just meant to help with the inflammation and didn't really do anything for the pain. Tramadol didn't help. And so even after I healed up from the surgery, I was needing Endone on a regular basis, like a couple times a week, every second day, due to the cramps that I was experiencing. So obviously the marina was causing a lot of pain and it had no upside. I was still bleeding um, the side effects from my actual like conditions were bad already and the pain was just even worse from the marina. So it didn't help in any capacity. And it also made my back pain worse. So I know I've said that I've always had back pain, but 
it was definitely worse during the time that I had the Marina and there was a weird side effect. I noticed that my doctor hadn't heard people say before, but he was open to the idea. Um, he said, oh, if this stops after you get the Marina out, you can blame the Marina. And that was the fact that I had back spasms pretty much the whole time I had the Marina in. I noticed a lot um, after I had my Marina and after the surgery that I would have spasms normally when I was lying down or resting my back sometimes when I was standing and I think maybe it was caused because of the back pain to so kind of a domino effect I'm not too sure because it has stopped now that the marine is out but that was quite a scary thing because it's something that I've never had before but obviously with back spasms and cramps so my uterus was always um, spasming even if it wasn't super painful it was always contracting. I could basically feel that marina there the whole time I had it and now that it's gone I do feel a lot better. So I know we got a little bit dark there for a minute and I am doing better without the marina. Obviously I still have my conditions to deal with but not a little device inside my uterus making things 10 times worse. Obviously I'm a lot happier without the marina but because I still needed more hormones to try and combat my conditions I was told that I should take Primalute, which I have taken before, and some people might have done this before as well, where you have to take three of them a day for a week to stop a long bleed, and that would always make me feel quite sick. I thought it was because of the high amount of pills that I had to take, but I've noticed that a little bit now as well when I take the Primalute every day, so I think I need to go off that as well. It kind of makes me feel like I have acid reflux or something, which I've never experienced and only something that I feel when I take the Primalute. So, yeah, there's always some sort of side effect that happens when you take anything I feel, especially in like larger quant quantities, let's say, even though I'm not taking a large amount of one specific thing, my body is being bombarded with hormones to try and combat the bleeding and the other side effects and it just causes more side effects. There's always something and I think a lot of people can relate to this if you are dealing with endo or adeno. It's a shitty thing already but then obviously the treatment options that we have can cause more troubles too. And the last thing to mention just to catch you up to speed is the fact I had my iron infusion and I know I mentioned that already but that was a recent thing. I think I had it about six weeks ago so it's probably time for me to have another blood test and check my iron levels but I know prior to having it done and I wish I knew what the numbers were. I know that my iron levels were like a quarter of what they should have been. So very low from bleeding all the time, unsurprisingly. All right, so I know I was a little bit scattered there, but hopefully that explains a little bit more so you'll understand something I'm about to say. In the past couple months, my health has definitely been on a roller coaster. Hasn't been great prior to that surgery. Getting my diagnosis with adeno obviously set me on this path after many years of pain and just frustration in my life. I've now come to a decision on something that I think will help and that is the fact that I'm going to pursue getting a hysterectomy. So I know that does sound extreme, a hysterectomy, getting the uterus out, but it is the only cure for adenomyosis at this point and I feel like I have truly exhausted all other options. Basically to summarize, I am still in pain every day and even though it was really bad with the marina, it's still really bad without it. Um, I'm still bleeding, even though it's not full-on bleeding at the moment, still spotting quite regularly, and this is through three hormonal contraceptives, or like hormonal treatments. I don't really know how to explain it since not everything is strict birth control, but I basically have three sources of hormones every single day, and I feel like that's taking a toll on me as well. All of these hormones in my body, I just have no control over my emotions, which I know sounds bad, I should have control. But, and I've been on the pill for a long time, 15 years now. I know a lot of people talk about like depression or different feelings when taking the pill for the first time. I'm on three things. I just feel crazy half the time. I have no control over my emotions and I'm sick of it. In terms of pain relief, for me personally, there are quite a few things that I take. Obviously heat packs help and um, TENS machines I've spoken about before, but for actual pain relief treatments that I do take. I realize I haven't said this before, but I do take medical marijuana now twice a day. And that does help because it is anti-inflammatory and it's sustained pain relief, but it's not a heavy pain relief. So 
it helps a little bit every day um, and I think maybe I'll notice it more as I take it like longer I've been taking it for two months now and other than that obviously I do still have strong painkillers I don't need them as much as when I had the marina but still a couple times a week it's just not working for me there's so many things that I feel are band-aid solutions to my core problem that technically can be easily fixed by this surgery and obviously it is a full-on surgery I'm not diminishing that but it kind of just seems like a no-brainer to me at this point especially considering everything I take does have its side effects and it's expensive it takes time to take these things and it's not really making me better so why wouldn't I make this choice I might have mentioned here or there in the past about my thoughts on having kids and the fact that I don't want to have them myself and my husband we don't want children I think I've spoken about that on the channel before and I've really become like stronger in this mindset in the past couple years in knowing that something that I don't want because I like my lifestyle the way it is I like to be able to have the things that I want in the house and have freedom to go places and do things and I love my dogs I feel like my maternal needs or instincts are met through them and I just I don't want to be a mum. I don't want to have children. I don't have a desire to be pregnant. And I suppose it's tricky. Maybe part of this mindset I have is because for a long time I've thought I couldn't have children because of the pains that I experienced. The fact that I suspected I had endo for a long time before I was diagnosed with it. And knowing that I have adenomyosis as well and officially knowing I have endo. Um, the chances of being able to have children are tricky anyway. So it's hard to say genuinely if I step outside of myself do I have this mindset because I don't think I can have them or I don't want them so it's easier like an easier pill to swallow and at the end of the day if I'm wrong if I change my mind I would love to adopt if I decide I want to be a mum there are so many children out there who need homes and whether it's through adoption or fostering or whatever the case might be there's plenty of ways to sort of fill that need for myself if I decide later down the line I want them but Certainly now, even if physically my body could get pregnant, go through pregnancy and deliver a baby healthily, I don't logistically know if that's possible for a second, if this makes sense. I need to be on like all of these hormones and birth control to stop myself bleeding constantly. Like I don't see myself being able to go off them to try and get pregnant in the first place. So this all seems like a no brainer to me. So the decision now does seem like an easy one. I think that really paints a picture of where I'm at in my mindset. My uterus does cause me pain every day. I have band-aid solutions, but they're just not good enough. And the bleeding is frustrating, like so it's annoying as well. And I don't want children. So why keep this organ if it's effectively useless? Now, I thought about this as well. Recently, my brother-in-law had his appendix taken out and I sort of became a little bit more strong in my thoughts on going for this hysterectomy. Like it's been a long time coming, but it helped settle my mind a little bit thinking that's an organ that causes pain and it's useless. So obviously when it causes pain, it gets taken out. I know that it's very different circumstances that lead people to an appendectomy over a hysterectomy, but it sort of settled my mind a little bit in just the fact that this organ isn't going to be used by me for having a baby and it's very painful so yeah it's a no-brainer i'm currently 29 now and i do think i will have this surgery before i'm 30. while it's not booked in yet i am starting to go down that path i've made the decision which i think is the first step my doctor knows that i want to do this and he's given me like literature to read so he's not going to be shocked when i tell him this is what i'm going to do and get him to do He's very supportive in like this whole path. I'm actually so grateful for my doctor. Actually, one of my friends has started going to see him as well. My friend who has endo. So that's kind of nice to get that set up. So hopefully she has a good outcome as well from a doctor who takes her seriously like I did. But yeah, I'm starting to take steps in that direction. I think I need to get my implant on out because it's actually expired or due to expire. So I need that out. I might have to change some of the hormonal stuff, but in a couple months time is my plan to get the hysterectomy. So I will definitely keep you up to date in terms of how that goes. Um, the process, I think for myself, considering it is a 
like the last option for me, it is arguably going to be easier. Like my doctor takes me serious to begin with, but I, my understanding is if anyone wants to get a hysterectomy just for their own free will, it is very difficult as a woman to do that because I know I've had friends in the past who were adamant they didn't want children or they didn't want periods or whatever the case might be and doctors gave them a really hard time. Um, on the flip side, I've had male friends who have had uh, vasectomies and that is very easy, <laughs> like a lunchtime procedure and I think doctors don't quiz and question them as much. So yeah, that's also something interesting to think about, but obviously another tangent for another time. Basically, as I plan and get ready for this surgery and I, I suppose down the track throughout that surgery and recovery period, I will definitely keep you in the loop. But of course, I wanted to share this with you now since it will be a big part of my life and I never want my channel to be all about medical stuff, which is why I tried to space the previous endo video from this adenomyosis one, but obviously it is a big part of my life. And I do hope whether you will regularly watch me, just my like vlogs and happy stuff, the vegan like cooking and everything like that, it's obviously gonna be a big change in my life, so it's for that. But if you have stumbled across this because you have adenomyosis as well, or endo, um, or someone in your life has it, hopefully this video has been informative, but especially from the last topic I've spoken about, I don't want you to think that you have to get a hysterectomy if you have adenomyosis. It's just something that I think I've decided because it makes the most sense to me. I've exhausted all other options and I don't want children. So obviously I feel pretty confident in this decision. I suppose I wanna cap this off and I think I've done this a few times in these updates. The main thing I'm going to take away is the fact that as bad as things were, I've got a plan in place for things to be better and I know they will be. So I'm gonna wrap it up here. Whether you regularly watch me and just am interested in this side of my life or if you are new here because of me talking about I don't know for adenomyosis awareness month, um, <laughs> tongue twisters, and like the hysterectomy point that I've obviously come to. I hope you enjoyed this video, no matter which camp you're from. If you enjoyed, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't already, and leave any questions or comments down below. But like I said, I will be leaving you here, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Bye.